Hey, it's Joe, and this is the fourth installment in the Quant Trading in Futures video series. Today's topic is performance metrics. So we've talked a lot about trading strategies, but one thing we haven't talked about yet is how to evaluate a trading strategy. What separates a good strategy from a bad one? And the performance metrics tell us how to do that. So the goal of any trading strategy is to maximize risk-adjusted returns. Everybody knows what returns are, but risk is a different story. There are many different definitions of risk. You can think of risk as volatility, i.e. a smooth ride up is preferred to a jagged, bumpy ride up. You can think about risk in terms of the correlation to our other investments. If the trading strategy does poorly when all the other investments are doing poorly, then we are really going to feel the pain when that happens. And we can think about risk as the worst case scenario loss. Ultimately, there's no one perfect measure of risk and therefore there's no one perfect performance metric. So it's important to look at things in aggregate and to see the whole picture. The simplest performance metrics are returns and volatility. Returns are the annual profits divided by the capital amount. Volatility is the annualized standard deviation of returns. So I have two simulated cumulative returns series. The one on the left clearly has more volatility than the one on the right. If I were to ask you which one you'd rather invest in, everyone's gonna say the one on the right. So while they both have high returns, because the one on the right has lower volatility, a lower standard deviation of returns, that is preferable. And that leads us right into a discussion of the Sharpe ratio and the Sortino ratio. The Sharpe ratio is the annual excess returns divided by the annual volatility. So the two metrics we just discussed, just take the ratio of those two. Specifically, the Sharpe is equal to the mean return mu minus the risk-free rate RF divided by the volatility sigma. The Sortino ratio is very similar to the Sharp ratio, but with the difference that instead of dividing by the volatility, it divides by the downside deviation, which is a measure of the volatility of only the negative returns. So Sortino equals mu minus RF over the downside deviation, which we'll denote as sigma minus. So Sharp is the gold standard metric of success, but the idea behind the Sortino is that it doesn't make sense punish upside volatility. You should only be punishing downside volatility because investors don't care about upside volatility. Now the counter argument for those who prefer the Sharpe ratio is that just because the volatility happened to be to the upside in the past, that isn't necessarily indicative that there will be volatility to the upside in the future. So that's the counter argument. It is an open debate amongst traders as to which metric is better, but the Sharpe is certainly more popular. We will be referring to the Sharpe many times throughout the rest of this video series. So it's very important to understand how it works. And later on, we're going to do a proof of how under certain conditions, Sharp can be written in terms of P&L rather than returns. That'll be at the end of this video. Two metrics that express risk in terms of the worst case scenario loss are the max drawdown and the expected shortfall. The max drawdown is quite literally the worst case scenario loss. It measures the largest peak to trough decline. So if you had entered on the worst possible day, and exited on the worst possible day, this is how much you would have lost. The problem with the max drawdown is it can be distorted by outliers. If there's one particularly bad drawdown, that's gonna throw off the whole number, even if it's not indicative of the entire period. The expected shortfall is one way to try to fix this. It is the mean return on the worst X percent of days, typically 5%. So instead of looking at just the one number like the max drawdown is doing, it is looking at the 5% of worst returns and taking the mean of those. But fundamentally, they're both trying to measure what's the worst thing that could happen, the worst possible loss. And finally, we get to two metrics that measure risk in terms of correlation to other investments, specifically correlation to the S&P 500, which tends to be used as a proxy for the overall stock market. You have alpha and beta. So alpha is the strategy's returns in excess of the S&P 500's returns. These are returns that you're getting no matter what the stock market does. Beta is the expected change in the strategy's returns due to an increase in the S&P 500's returns. So these, in contrast to alpha, these are returns you're getting just because of overall increases in the stock market. Both metrics are computed by regressing the strategy's returns against the S&P 500 returns. Alpha is the intercept in this linear regression, and beta is the slope. So you can see here in the illustration, the strategy returns tend to be higher when the S&P 500 returns are higher, the strategy returns tend to be lower when the S&P 500 returns are lower. So this is characteristic 
of a positive beta strategy. Most of the time we're looking for strategies that have betas close to zero or, e or even negative. We want strategies that are making returns independently of the stock market, not because of the stock market. And when you have a lower beta, that typically corresponds to having a larger alpha. Alpha here you can see is the intercept. And once again, alpha, these are the returns you're making independently of the stock market. So you want the lion's share of your returns to be coming from alpha, not coming from beta. The last two metrics we're going to discuss today are the win rate and the risk reward ratio. And these two metrics help to describe the shape of your returns distribution. The win rate is a fraction of returns that are positive. The risk reward ratio is the average loss divided by the average win. So we've actually discussed both of these metrics in spirit in the prior video where we went through the common quant trading strategies. If you remember, momentum strategies are characterized by many small losses and a few big wins, and mean reversion strategies are characterized by many small wins and a few big losses. So momentum strategies will have low win rates, but also a low risk reward ratio, and mean reversion strategies will have a high win rate, but a high risk reward ratio. And each metric can be used to calculate break-evens for the other. You can calculate the break-even win rate in terms of the risk reward ratio, and you can calculate the break-even risk reward ratio in terms of the win rate. So if you have a strategy as a win rate of 80%, but its break-even win rate is 79%, it's probably not that great of a strategy. So it helps to contextualize things. It also gives you realistic expectations moving forward. So how often is this strategy going to win? How much does it make when it wins? And how much does it lose when it loses? And now we're going to get into the Sharpe ratio proof. The theorem states that for futures trading with uncompounded returns, the mean of annual returns minus the risk-free rate divided by the standard deviation of annual returns this is the classical Sharp ratio definition. That is equivalent to the square root of 252 times the mean of daily strat PL divided by the standard deviation of daily strat PL. So a lot of things going on here. The risk-free rate disappears from the equation. On the left-hand side you have returns, on the right-hand side you have PL, and specifically strat PL. And you go from annual returns on the left-hand side to daily strat PL on the right-hand side. And then to top it off, this square root of 252 number appears seemingly out of the ether. So let's dive in. So the first thing we're going to do is discuss an assumption of that theorem that we're using uncompounded returns. If you do compound the returns, the Sharpe ratio formula does not make sense. So let's walk through an example where you have a strategy that gains 100%. Let's say it goes $100 to $200, and then it loses 50% of that $200. So back down to $100. The mean return here is 25% because the mean of positive 100 and negative 50 is positive 25. But the total profit is $0. You started at $100, you ended at $100. If you're using the uncompounded returns, the strategy that gains 100% and then loses 50% really does have a mean return of 25% because the capital base is the same. So you gain 100% on $100 to go up to 200 and then you lose 50% on that initial $100, and that brings you down to $150. So the mean return here really is positive 25%. So you don't want to be using the compounded returns to take the Sharpe ratio, because it could give you a number that's not accurate. Finally, let's define some variables here. So let's let R be the return series, P1 to PN be the daily PNLs, and K be the capital amount. So R equals P1 over K, all the way through to Pn over K. Removing the risk-free rate. So as we discussed in the first video, the introduction to futures, because of the inherent leverage in futures, often only about 5% to 10% of the account is covering the margin requirement. So the other 90 to 95% can be invested in treasury bills and can earn the risk-free rate. The Sharpe ratio is measuring the returns in excess of the risk-free rate, but futures traders are going to end up getting 90 to 95 percent of the risk-free rate anyway, so it ends up canceling out. So for futures, the mean of annual returns minus the risk-free rate divided by the standard deviation of annual returns, again the classic Sharpe ratio formula, that is equivalent to the mean of annual strat returns divided by the standard deviation of annual strat returns. So note that on the left-hand side you have just regular returns, and on the right-hand side you have strat returns. That's because the total returns as a futures trader, 
will be the strat returns plus the returns from the risk-free rate. And so you subtract out the risk-free rate and you're left with only the strat returns. So now we're going to discuss annualizing the Sharpe ratio. So in the formulas for mean and variance, the sum is multiplied by 1 over n to normalize the units. So in the mean formula, it's 1 over n times the sum. In the variance formula, it's 1 over n times the sum of the squared differences from the mean. But in both cases, you're multiplying by 1 over n to normalize the units. And in this specific case, you're multiplying by 1 over n to get the units in terms of one trading day. If you want to get it in terms of m trading days, you multiply instead by m over n. So the mean mu goes to m mu, and the variance sigma squared goes to m sigma squared, implying that sigma goes to the square root of m times sigma. Now let's let s be the Sharpe ratio. So s equals mu over sigma. The risk-free rate isn't there because of what we discussed in the prior slide. s equals mu over sigma. That goes to m mu over the square root of m sigma which ends up equaling the square root of m times s. So s goes to the square root of m times s when you're scaling it to a time frame of m trading days. There are approximately 252 trading days in a year, so if you're annualizing the Sharpe ratio, you just have to set m equals 252. And so we get that the annual Sharpe is equal to the square root of 252 times the daily Sharpe. Here I have the algebra for computing Sharpe in terms of PL. And here I have the algebra for computing Sharpe in terms of returns. So I won't go through all the details here, but the important thing to note is that the Sharpe ratios are the same whether you're using the returns or using the PLs. And I've attached these slides in the comments, so feel free to look through the slides and go through the algebra if you'd like to. And finally, we've completed the proof. For futures trading with uncompounded returns, the mean of annual returns minus the risk-free rate divided by the standard deviation of annual returns is equivalent to the square root of 252 times the mean of daily strategy PL divided by the standard deviation of daily strategy PL. So we removed the risk-free rate and swapped out the total returns for the strat returns because for futures you're going to be getting 90 to 95 percent of the risk-free rate anyway. We've annualized the Sharpe ratio by multiplying by the square root of 252 number and switching it from annual returns to daily returns. And finally, as we showed in the prior two slides, if you're using uncompounded returns or if you're using PL, you end up with the same number in your Sharpe ratio calculation. So, what was the point of all this? Why did we go through the trouble of this proof? It's because it makes things much simpler when you're back testing a strategy. All you need to do is compute your daily PL vector, take the mean of that PL vector, the standard deviation of that PL vector, and multiply by the square root of 252, and you have your Sharpe ratio. You don't need to specify a capital base, you don't need to look up the risk free rate, just is a very nice simplification. So that will be it for this video on performance metrics. Next time we're going to discuss overfitting.